From awaytogarden.com and robinhoodradio.com, this is A Way to Garden with Margaret Roach, your weekly invitation to dig in and grow. They're the garden's biggest residents, relative space hogs who also dictate a lot of what goes on with the patterns of light and shade. I'm talking about trees, and today Ken Drews and I are going to name some names of favorites, our desert island trees, if you will, the ones we can't imagine gardening without. But first, these messages. Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon-sized plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. BrushwoodNursery.com. You probably knew it when you heard us try to narrow down our lists of desert island shrubs a month or two ago on the podcast. Trees would be next. And this time... We'll try to narrow down our list of must-have trees and explain why we can't live without each one. You all know Ken, great gardener, great friend of many years, and author and photographer of 20 great gardening books. So hello over there, Ken. Oh, hello, Margaret. (laughs) (laughs) I was thinking this time we'll tell everybody if they go to the transcript of the show on awaytogarden.com that I'm going to give away a copy of Away to Garden, my book, which we haven't done in a while. We've been giving copies of the new shade garden yearbook the last couple of rounds but let's do one of mine okay that's very nice yes. okay so with that housekeeping out of the way shrubs versus trees we did shrubs last time both are woody plants they're a little bit different but there's not this precise kind of difference it has more to do with it has a trunk a certain amount of the way up before it branches out into other stems is that the idea tree versus shrub versus shrub sure yeah. And it can be evergreen or it can be needle evergreen or it could be deciduous, losing its leaves in the fall. Yeah, I mean, I have um, two trees among my favorite trees that are shrubs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, never mind. Sorry, no, I just no, screwed just the whole thing up. <laughs> but but the, the native white eastern white pine, Pinus strobus, there's a... a, a, a a selection or whatever called uh, Pinus strobus nana or small. It's a dwarf white pine. I planted them 30 years ago. I have a couple of them now. They're like giant bond size. So it's the it's the tree, but it's in a small form. Yeah, you know. So is it a shrub? Is it a tree? <laughs> well, does it still have? Does it still start with a single stem down yes. at the bottom? So I guess it's a tree. It's a dwarf tree. Yeah, and then similarly. Came in the mail 25 years ago or more, probably. Tiny, tiny little thing, a grafted uh, thing, a cutting. And um, it's a cornus cusa that's name, whose name is Lust Garten Weeping for the uh, mm-hmm. nursery men on Long Island, uh, Baron Lust Garten and so forth, who who introduced it. And and so it's it's small. It's um five feet tall and nine or ten feet across you know it's like a mound and so but it's a cornus cusa it's a tree but it's not a tree (laughs) (laughs) oh sorry (laughs) i think we just accept dwarf and weeping trees as trees okie dokie and we we include giant sequoias as trees (laughs) i guess there's quite a range but they do have the single stem in common indeed so where do you want to start? I mean, oh what's a favorite? Gosh. Yeah, I know you, you're a tree man. You mentioned so many things. You know, I was thinking of what makes a tree a favorite. Uh, and I, I started making a list. It's health. It's oddity. It's uniqueness. It's history. It's color. It's shape. It's spark. It's leap or needles. It's uses. It's design uses. Stop me. <laughs> Stop <laughs> that. So many, we just love them. And, and uh, you mentioned something about I, I don't know if you said grafting, but uh, mm-hmm. most of the trees that we buy that are unusual are grafted uh, to a an understock uh, that is the same species, but not odd or not different. Right. But a lot of trees are grown from seed. I have some 
very unusual trees that finally, after eight years, have flower buds all over them. And I'll find out what happens with them. And they are favorites if they indeed perform correctly. And sometimes you can start trees from cuttings. But it's a little bit difficult to start trees from cuttings because plants that are mature don't easily root. And trees, that's another characteristic, they're Mm. generally mature. They have bark and they're flowering. Uh, You know, they're grown up. But I, I was at Cornell and I saw that they were taking oak trees and cutting them down to about 12 inches. And then they'd push up all these soft sprouts and they made cuttings of them and rooted them. Oh, so it's young tissue from yeah. an old tree, a former Soft old young tree. tissue, right. Okay, okay. That was All a right. surprise. <laughs> okay, yeah. favorites. Uh, we, I'll do one, you do one. I know Just you. Just go for it. Yeah. Liquid ambar, slender silhouette. And you know I have about eight of them. <laughs> and what is liquid ambar? Tell us, the, give us the English. I think it's sweet gum. Is that yeah. what it is? Yeah. And usually it has those sharp gumballs with prickers, uh, but slender silhouette is sterile uh, or male, I'm not sure. And it was found as a mutation and it's it's really, really slender. I've got one that's probably about 40 feet tall and maybe two feet wide. Wow. It's unbelievably narrow. And you know, I like stuff like that. Well, I was going to say, we've had whole conversations about your thing for columnar or fastigiate uh, mostly woody plants. And so we can link to that as well for more ideas in that vein from boxwoods to trees. So, yeah. Well, I like the way they look, but I also get to have a lot more plants because they don't <laughs> take up much room. Yeah, sardines. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you want to tell another one? Oh, all right, unless you want to. No, go one. for it. Um, oh, boy, there's so many. How about Dawn Redwood? Oh, yes, yes, yes. So the Metasequoia glyptostraboides, is that oh, correct? Oh, wow. Yeah, you could say it. <laughs> well, I don't know. I just made it up. Yeah. No, that's true. And I think we've told a story before uh, when we were chatting of how it's a, maybe it's for the dawn of time that it got the name. It also has nice fall color. It's a deciduous conifer. So it has needles, but they drop in the fall, they turn color, and then they drop. And it's very fast growing until it hits about 90 feet, and then it gets wide. But I've got one that's 25 years old, and it's about 90 feet tall. Wow. I have one, two, I have two of the plain green one, Mm. old, and three of the uh, is it Gold Rush or what's the name of the cultivar of the gold leaved one? Uh, Metasequoia. Metasequoia. I think it might be Gold Rush, but at any rate, it's I'll, funny I'll look it up. It has another name, which is Aurea. <laughs> it may just be that, and Aurea meaning meaning yellow uh, or gold. So, gold, um, right. yeah, yeah. And and the thing that I love about this majestic, as you said, it gets very very big, and it gets like muscular, big down at the base eventually, and it has shaggy. Flaring. Yes, yeah. shaggy, cinnamony bark. You know, it's really rooted. It looks like it's so anchored at the base. Um, but it has these very delicate needles, you know. They're just fine textured and beautiful. And and then sometimes around late winter, like if I'm doing spring cleanup or whatever, I'll see on the ground these tiny little cones. I mean, like a size of a marble. Mm-hmm. Beautiful cones. And they're in this massive tree has these tiny little cones, and it's just so the juxtaposition just delights me each time I come upon <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah, so that's a treasure. That's a treasure, right? And it, it was found uh, in about 1948 in China, and it was thought to be extinct. They only knew it from fossil records and fo- some fossil records from the United States. But the living tree was found in China, and then seed was brought over and grown at the Arnold Arboretum. And in 1950, some people got them, and it turns out it's not so hard from seed. (laughs) So now a lot of people have them. Okay, so moving onward. You want me to to keep going? Yeah, just keep going for a while. uh, Listen, I could go. So uh, (laughs) this is a plant I want you to try to grow. Yes, sir. And it is a southern magnolia. Oh, which we think is not hardy, but there are a few hardy ones. But I have been growing, oh gosh, over 20 years, Magnolia grandiflora, Edith Bogue. 
And it's not the prettiest southern magnolia, but I have it growing on the road, and every winter it gets splashed with salt, and it is a broadleaf evergreen, and it does have fragrant flowers. But this thing, wow, it's tough as nails. And I, it's gone down to minus 15 here once, and it didn't, it, it didn't get burned or anything. And the leaves now, they're kind of thick textured, large, beautiful, yeah, large, about, shiny on one side, indumentum, like a yeah, velvety well, just, on the other. Yeah, bogue is a little light in the brown department. <laughs> okay, but a lot of the Southern Magnolias have that indumentum, the, right. the soft, fuzzy, felty stuff felty, on the underside. Right. Okay. Okay, so do those leaves then dry up and fall off every few years? Or... Yeah, it's, it's sort of... Well, I, I can't even say it's semi-evergreen because it's never not without leaves. Right. It's kind of like uh, what we call an evergreen azalea. It tends to drop about a third to a half okay. of its leaves. Okay. And if you put it in a place where you don't care, then it's not a big mess. But it happens kind of all at once. So you can just rake them up if you care. I have it, as I said, against the as at the outer edge of the property along the road as a screen. And it's wonderful because it does get tall. Uh, and uh, I just let the leaves drop where they do. And flowers? The flowers are almost mm, close to 12 inches across. Wow. And they're white and fleshy, and they don't last very long. But Edith Bogue, the flowers smell very lemony. I have another one called Bracken's Brown Beauty that isn't quite as hardy, and it's dwarf, lots of brown felt, and its flowers smell like ginger. Oh, and you're Mr. Scent over there. You did I that sure am. the sensual garden book this last year uh, about scent in plants. So you would know. You would have gone around sticking your nose in all of them and comparing. Them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do that. I, yeah. I stick my nose in everything. Oops. My oldest, my oldest, uh, tr no, that's not true. That's a lie. Uh, the, the oldest tree that I bought um, when I came here as opposed to brought with me from my former garden in Long Island in Queens. The oldest tree is a magnolia. It's a deciduous magnolia. It's a, a Lebner or Loebner, L-O-E-B-N-E-R, oh. Lebner I, Loebner I. Um, it's magnolia uh, ballerina. Mm. And the thing, it, a nurseryman nearby, Windy Hill Firm in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, great nurseryman, uh, Dennis Marab, he said to me that first year, and you know, I didn't know him or anything, and I went there and asked, what should I have as a magnolia? And he said, you want these because these bloom 10 days later than others. And therefore, you'll never lose your flowers to a frost, to a late frost. He said, they just it's just those 10 days that make a difference. And, you know, I don't know if that's the exact formula, but that was his observation. And he's planted them. He does landscaping as well for the last 40 years and has planted them for many people. And don't you know? In all these years, I've always had flowering on that magnolia. So, you know, because a lot of them, you can get those nasty brown. And I, and yeah. sometimes I'll get on the last bit of the flower uh, flush, you know, I'll get a few that'll go brown in the late frost. But, boy, I've always had flowering. So that's nice. I finally removed my Solangiana, the, the very common, pink. I don't know what. Yeah, it's pinky, purple. Saucer and, magnolia. Right. And yeah. uh, it was old, but I think it the blooms hung on one out of every five years. It's just, it's not worth it. So um, I'm going to throw in a couple of trees. Um, I said just now that was the first one I bought after, and I brought one along. And it's definitely my treasure of all treasures. It's it's a conifer. It's the Cyadopidus for Tisolata, the uh, Japanese umbrella pine. It's not a pine at all. It's very ancient. <laughs> it's like ginkgo. It's the only one in its genus. You know, it's, it's uh -huh. yeah, monotypic. Is that what you call right, that? Monotypic. When you're the only one in your genus? Um <laughs> Uh, Are you I'm, the only, me? <laughs> I'm the only one in my <laughs> my loony world. But and and this is a very it's the thing that everybody loves when they come for garden tours in years we can have garden tours and I brought it I had started a garden at my mother's house when she was ill uh, when I was in my 20s my first gardening experiences and I had planted this then very very rare conifer and I just couldn't bear to leave it with me when we had to sell the the house eventually she was too ill and um, I brought it with me in the moving van in a bushel basket and planted it and it survived. I didn't know anything about hardiness zones then. Every day I think of, you know, 
we came here together, that tree and I. So highly loved tree. I think that's that's another tree that in the old days, they didn't know how hardy it was. Or Correct. They, they would say, oh, no, you can't grow this, but you can. Yeah. 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 So that's a favorite for sure. Um, you want to tell me another of yours? Oh, my gosh. Sure. Um, well, I, I was thinking about telling you about my Cornus Florida Urbiniana, which I have grown from seed. I'm not going to get into it too much, but now in its eighth year, it has flower buds all over it. And it has, it's a dogwood, a white flowering Cornus Florida from Mex the mountains of Mexico. It's perfectly hardy and the flower bracts are fused. So they look like little flying saucers. They and do. I'm, I'm going to have my kind of my first flowers on about five of these trees. And if they're not fused, those trees are going away. <laughs> I'm going right. to cut them down because they're in the way and they're very tall. Um, but that's just something that's on my mind because it, it, they haven't ever bloomed before. And growing trees from seeds, hmm, and they're they're easily 15 feet tall. All right. So this is another getting back to that sort of why are so many trees grafted? Because when you use an asexual or clonal form of reproduction graft like grafting, you end up with the exact thing that was in the previous right. generation, right? And so by starting these from seed, and I have from the same nurseryman that I just mentioned, I have a Cornus cusa from seed. So when I bought it from him, you know, there were named ones that I would have known exactly from the pictures in a catalog, what the flowers would have looked like and blah, blah, blah. So I, but this was much cheaper and it was fun. And I thought, Hey, you know, Dennis grew these from seed. I'm going to buy one. Cause I loved his, you know, other things over the years. And, and, but I didn't know in advance would have big flowers, lots of flowers, small flowers. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So because genetics vary in a seedling population, there's the great, variation in in the genetic in the gene pool which is how plants survive and adapt and thrive and go on for zillions of years is by having did you say whether you got flowers on that i did it, it i didn't i there was no way to see the flowers i bought it very young right and, and and but once it started flowering it was fabulous so i have a couple of acer japonicum actinidifolium aconitifolium because it has leaves like an aconitum which are very divided one of my favorite plants and i've grown them from seed and one of them is about 35 years old and really has the best fall color of anything but i can't actually say that it's an aconitifolium because it's from seed even though right. it really resembles the the selection completely it looks just like it so what you just said in 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 latin gibberish is that it's the Acer japonicum or Japanese maple, aconitifolium, which means looks like an aconite or a monk's hood, which mm -hmm. is a per herbaceous perennial. Like, how's that for a mouthful? <laughs> I, I love it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I have a lot of Japanese maples, which I grow in pots and take very, very large pots and take into the garage, the unheated garage to store them for the winter. And that's a whole other story, which wow. we'll talk about another time. Um but um, but I used to grow, and this was a great, I've had two losses in recent years of favorite trees, longtime friends that were with me, um, uh, Acer pseudo Sibaldianum, which is a Korean maple, sort of mm. looks like a Japanese maple, but hardier. And the same nurseryman again said to me, Margaret, if you want uh, a Japanese maple, quote unquote, Japanese maple to go in the ground here and our cold zone 5B and do well year after year, it's kind of either the blood good, you know, the typical reddish mm. one that you see, or, um, and this is back a lot of years, or pseudo subaldianum, this Korean one. And don't you know, it was just fabulous for years and years and years, decades. And then one day, it just literally, it never leafed out. It wasn't even sick the year before. And I under, I assume it's some was some fungal disease or something mm -hmm. underground going on that it, it succumbed to a disease that was hidden. Um, so very, very sad. I, you know, didn't want to replace it because if there was a disease in the soil, et cetera. So, um, but that's a fantastic, incredible fall color, like nothing you've ever seen oh, and wow. hardy as a bone. So pseudo huh. Um Yeah. So a couple, a couple more. Did you ever grow a paperback maple? I mean, a paper bark maple? I haven't, but I, I like them and I see them around here. Yes. Acer grissium, it has exfolium, exfoliating bark, 
which is sort of uh, amber, and there's a lot of it in in the fall. The sunlight goes just illuminates them, and it looks like all these shaggy bits are glowing. It's really that's a beautiful and very popular slow growing smallish maple, mm-hmm. which beautiful grown for its bark. Um, you know, you talked about diseases and stuff. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't get into it. We won't. Uh, do you know Abe's Coriana Horseman Silver Lock? I don't know that Korean fur, but I just have plain old Abe's Coriana and purple cones, incredible cones. Incredible cones. Yeah. Well, Silver Lock, the needles curve. So if you ever look at the bottom of the needles on, on your fur, they're silver on the bottom. They're glaucous. Yes. Well, on silver lock, they curl around so that that silver is uh, is all around the whole branch and can be seen from the top. There's that silver lock means silver hair, so uh, it's really amazing. So in the last, we have you know four minutes maybe left, and I we ha- we mentioned Kusa dogwoods, but we didn't mention any other dogwoods. Do you want to quickly? Oh, I m- I mentioned the herbi- herbi- Oh, you did. Herbiana, that's right. That's right. right. Do, do you grow any of the other ones? Um, well, I didn't get into the Kusa wolf eyes, which oh. I've got something wrong with it. And, and after mine died. years, I know, mine years died. and years and years, a beautiful variegated uh, Kusa dogwood with nice flowers and everything, white flowers. And it was a showpiece. It was, I mean, it stopped traffic, this gorgeous tree. And all of a sudden it started to decline. I've had to cut some parts out of it. I think, just like you said, it's some kind of wilt disease that's yeah. in the soil or at the bottom of the trunk, and it's sort of killing off that cambium layer beneath the bark. You can't really see it, and I don't think you can treat it either. Yeah, the only thing there, and, and my nurseryman friend also said to me when I lost my my uh, my Korean uh, maple, he said, you know, you could, and he told me the name of the pathology lab, the nearest university one, uh, UMass Amherst. And he said, you know, you could send your samples there. And the extension systems throughout the country can tell people if they really want to know, because sometimes you want to know because you want to know if you can replant with a similar mm-hmm. species, you know, you can get a diagnosis if you really want to send in material for a test and they tell you what to do. So um, I wanted to say one that, that I lost another one that I lost. I'm just talking about dead <laughs> trees, but seriously, and this is a great small tree. I cr- I'm crazy about um, the the Aeschylus. I guess they're Buckeyes. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and um, lots of different shrubby ones. And there's a small tree with red flowers um, called Aeschylus pavia, the red Buckeye. And I had that for so many years. And then similar to that maple, it just last year it just that was it. It just didn't leaf out. It didn't decline. It was beautiful the year before and then kaboom. So, you know, go figure. But that's one that I will replace. Um, I'm going to put it in a different spot. Um, but that's one that I, I don't want to garden without. It's so Have you taken it out, the body? Yes, I did. So it had roots and everything. So it, it wasn't like everything. somebody ate the roots. No, 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 no. So if anybody goes to Williamsburg in Virginia, there are some there that are very old, probably almost 50 years old, if you can imagine. And they are thick trees. They're not tall, like you said, but in bright sun in Virginia, they're just magnificent, incredible mm. trees. For us, they're small, very small trees. Yes. So you have exactly a half a minute to tell us about one more. Do you have one more on your Sursa anything? Sarsidophyllum japonica marioka weeping, which is a weeping katsura. And that's, uh, well, Katsura is the common name. <laughs> yeah. And the t- this one, Marioka weeping, is tall. It it goes up probably to about 30 feet, and then it's just dripping with these long, weeping, light branches. But there's another one called Pendula that only goes to about 10 feet. It's 10 feet tall and about 12 feet wide. And I have them both, and I also have the species. And it has great fall color. And there's my 22nd tree. He's a tree addict, folks. He's just confessed it. I'm um, a and plant we, did, we didn't even mention crab apples, which is the tree I have the most of. Anyway, another show. Mm-hmm. Ken Drews, thank you very much. And ho, ho, ho. And I will talk to you soon. My pleasure. 
programming, and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon-sized plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. Brushwoodnursery.com. Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. And I hope we'll talk to all the rest of you soon again. Now, don't miss an episode. You can subscribe free to the podcast version of the show on Stitcher or iTunes or Spotify. And you can find me anytime at AwayToGarden.com or on Facebook and on Instagram as at Away to Garden. Happy gardening meantime. Away to Garden with Margaret Roach is a joint production of AwayToGarden.com and the smallest NPR station in the nation, Robin Hood Radio.